హలో గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ లేడీస్ అండ్ జెంట్లమన్ వెల్కమ్ టు ట్రిపుల్ ఎన్ మీడియా కార్డియాలజీ లెక్చర్స్ ఐ ఆమ్ డాక్టర్ నిక్ నికమ్ టుడే వీ ఆర్ గోయింగ్ టు లుక్ అట్ ఫేస్ మేకర్స్ బేసిక్స్ టు బెడ్ సైడ్ ఇవాల్యుయేషన్ దిస్ ఈస్ గుడ్ ఫార్ రెసిడెంట్స్ ఫెలోస్ కార్డియాలజిస్ట్ ఇన్ జనరల్ ప్రాక్టీస్ టు హ్యావ్ ఎ బేసిక్ అండర్స్టాండింగ్ ఆఫ్ హౌ ద ఫేస్ మేకర్స్ వర్క్ వాట్ టు లుక్ ఫార్ and how do you evaluate pacemakers in your office or in clinic and how to interpret those results so this will be quite an interesting educational experience stay till the end so you can learn something about pacemakers this can be applied even in a hospital setup pacemakers as you all know is basically consisting of a power pack or a battery as it is called but it's much more than a battery it is more sophisticated than your smartphone and your desktop computer and we will see how it stacks up it has electrodes that are coming into the vein into the right side of the heart one wire maybe in the atrium the second one in the right ventricle that helps us to pace atria and the ventricles to keep the heart rhythm from going a set rate the main purpose of the pacemaker is to maintain a steady heart rate but that is just the beginning of the entire spectrum of what pacemakers can do and you will be amazed at uh, how sophisticated the pacemakers today are how much information they gather and how they can transmit this information remotely using wifi so that their pacemakers can be checked without these people leaving their home the pacemaker size was like 200 cc and over a period of decades the pacemaker size sizes have come down to about 35 grams and actually the cost of this pacemaker is more than what it costs to buy a gram of gold so this is more important than gold especially if you need a pacemaker or a defibrillator but nonetheless this little box has so much information that can keep a human heart going for 8 to 10 years and that is the most fascinating thing about pacemakers as i showed you before the pacemaker may have one two or three wires going into the heart serving different purposes which we will cover in detail let's just take a look at how pacemakers work what does the pacemaker contain and how does it process the information first of all the pacemaker has a battery it also has a brain chip called the central processing unit and it has software programming and it also has a storage from the time a pacemaker is placed in the body it records and stores every heartbeat so that every 3 months that information can be remotely downloaded into a computer for analysis and report generation along with that it has its main functions which include sensing the atrial activity pacing the atrium sensing the ventricular activity pacing the ventricles and inhibiting the atria or ventricles it can detect rate rhythm and in addition to that sometimes it can pace the heart faster than an existing rapid tachycardia and this terminate the rhythm and i talked about the inhibition by that means it's suppressing the pacemaker from firing the ventricles when it is not needed and i mentioned about transmission of uh, the data from the previous 3 months or 6 months so that we know where the pacemaker has been and what the patient has been doing and how the heart rate has been responding in patients who have a defibrillator built into their pacemaker also have what is called a capacitor it is similar to an external defibrillator which we charge first before we shock so that's it's the same function the battery charges a capacitor with energy and when it thinks it is appropriate to deliver a shock assuming the patient has ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation then it delivers the shock even till the last millisecond the pacemaker is constantly analyzing like a boeing 747 jet to see what is the most appropriate action 
it may be charged it may be ready to deliver the shock but if it thinks the arrhythmia terminated by itself it would abort the shock so the patient doesn't feel that terrific uh, electrical shock that they feel when they have this defibrillation effect these are all built into this 35 to 50 gram little box here is uh, this the battery the central processing unit and the memory chip and the storage chip then we have the electrodes going into the heart chambers and here is a, a reproduction of the same thing which we talked about the battery is usually placed under the left or the right shoulder area and the wires come through these veins into the atrium into the ventricles and the third wire goes into the coronary sinus to activate the left side of the heart and here is this example which i was just talking about we have one wire going into the right atrial appendage we have the second one going into the right ventricular apex we have the third wire which is going through this coronary sinus behind the heart and into the lateral cardiac vein so it can activate the left ventricle this particular model is known as the CRT or cardiac resynchronization therapy where we have both the right and the left ventricles activated at the same time which can improve cardiac performance by as much as 20% here is a chest x-ray of a patient with a pacemaker and as you can see we have two wires here one in the atrium one in the ventricle and in addition to that we have a little thick like sausage like uh, wire here and when we see that that's an indication that we are dealing with a defibrillator or an intracardiac defibrillator or the ICD and here is your battery which has the capacity to last anywhere from 8 to 10 years i wish we had such batteries for cars and especially this double a batteries i hope they come up with a damn double a battery that can last for 10 years i am tired of paying money for those double a batteries every 3 days anyway the cpu can you imagine the cpu lasting for 10 years how long does your computer memory uh, boxes last 3 4 years then you have to upgrade it but these are so sophisticated they can function for 10 years that's pretty good then we have these electrodes which are connected for transmission of the impulse the pacemaker not only receives the impulse from these uh, signal wires it also transmits the uh, signal and it synchronizes the heart function like the normal human heart would do so that uh, it replicates a normal heartbeat and here is a pacemaker which has uh, oh gosh it has three wires one two three wires one in the atrium here in the appendage this is in the right ventricular uh, cavity tip here's a one going through the coronary sinus into the lateral cardiac vein so this is called the CRT or cardiac resynchronization treatment and this battery is little bit bigger than the previous one we saw all right so here is a pacemaker which has two wires and this is called the dual chamber pacemaker because it's activating the atrium and the right ventricle so that's how we differentiate the various types of pacemakers by looking at the chest x-rays but when you are seeing a patient who has a pacemaker when you look at their shoulder this is how it should look this is a normal looking pacemaker site if it is red and if you see some screen breakdown it could be looking at cellulitis or there could be an infected pocket underneath that skin and here is a case of a an infection where the skin has gaped and you can see the metal case of the pacemaker so this is an ugly situation in these situations we may have to take the pacemaker out and put a temporary pacemaker let it heal for 6 weeks and you may have to go on the other side to put a new pacemaker so this is not a good news you don't want to see this in your practice so to keep everything safe you need to have a work like this
I talked about the conventional pacemakers where we have a battery which is under your shoulder then the wires go into your heart now we have a new pacemaker called the leadless pacemaker this is look at the size of the quarter the the width is just a little bigger than the size of the quarter and the width is even like half that of a quarter and it looks like a capsule and there are some wires here and these wires are secured into the right heart muscle so it doesn't jump up and go in somewhere else and this has enough electrical gadgets to pace the heart to recognize the atrial activity and then recognize the ventricular activity and generate an electrical impulse. These kinds of leadless pacemakers will be coming more and more into the market as the technology advances and they do serve certain purposes. It may not act like uh, the more sophisticated uh, dual chamber or CRT pacemaker, but if you are just looking to maintain a simple rhythm in a person whose life expectancy is not very long, then this is a good alternative and the advantage is you don't have all these wires and pockets coming so there's less chance of an infection and it serves the purpose. This is the new kid on the block in the field of pacemakers which has been around for almost uh, like more than a half a century and this is the new kid on the block. In fact uh, some of these have been placed at the Methodist Hospital in uh, Houston my home city. You're going to see more and more of these as time goes on. Then we have another device which is not a pacemaker but it is something that receives the information from the heart in patients with irregular heart rhythms who have these episodes and we can cache them on these regular monitors or halter monitors. Then we can put this uh, cardiac implantable electronic device known as ILR and here's the actual size of the ILR which is uh, less than the width of your finger and it probably covers one to one and a half uh, phalanx length and it has a battery it can detect asystole it can detect bradycardia it can detect arrhythmias it can also detect ventricular tachycardia and fibrillation in addition to that it records all this information and wirelessly transmit this information to the monitoring center so that they can see what kind of arrhythmias these patients are getting. The beauty of this ILR is that it can last for three years or more so that you can monitor these patients long term. We can also monitor how these patients are doing with drug treatment for like atrial fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia and see if the drugs have been successful in reducing the frequency of these episodes so that uh, you can decide as if you need to keep the same medications or if there's a need to change the medications. If these patients are having rapid heartbeats, it will also signal that maybe we need a change of course in the management of those patients. All right, now I introduced to you about uh, the various functions and capabilities of a pacemaker. We're going to look at some of these elements like sensing, pacing, evaluation of battery life, generating a report and interpreting the report so that we so that we can follow these patients on a regular basis to make sure the pacemaker is doing the function it's supposed to be doing, is able to identify some irregularities in the rhythm or rate and help us to reprogram these pacemakers if needed for optimal cardiac function. Whenever a pacemaker is placed, the patients usually get a card with the doctor's name along with the model number that was used in this particular patient. This card is quite useful. Based on this, they can check and see what company the pacemaker belongs to and what particular model was used. And if there's any question uh, about MRI compatibility, they can call this 1-800 number. Okay, the main function of a pacemaker basically is to one, identify the underlying rhythm and see is there an underlying rhythm if there is no underlying rhythm then the pacemaker comes in and takes over 
by its own rhythm. That means it has to first recognize, it has to sense the cardiac activity. So that is the first step. The second step is pacing. If there's no heart activity, it paces the heart. Then if it sees the heart function, it inhibits the pacemaker so it won't fire at the same time when you're seeing a normal heartbeat. The fourth function is uh, sometimes the pacemaker responds to the increased metabolic demand and increases the rate automatically. So let's look at some of these functions. They are designated by letters. In the first place, letter represents the chamber which is being paced, which is being activated like ting, 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 being activated. The second one is sensing. Hello, ting, oh, I, I heard that. Ting, I heard that. I didn't hear anything. I think it's time for me to fire. Ting, that's sensing. Then once it hears the sensing, once the pacemaker hears, okay, beat, good. Beat, good. No beat, fire. So it knows when it needs to be inhibited and when it needs to trigger the activity. And the fourth one is the rate modulation. So if you commonly you see this as D, 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 R, that means that pacemaker is capable of uh, dual chamber pacing, dual chamber sensing, dual chamber triggered or inhibition, and it is rate modulation or rate responsive. So these are the factors which help to identify the functions of a given pacemaker so that we have a better understanding of what it is capable of and more importantly what it is not capable of like terminating a tachyarrhythmia or shocking the patient something like that. All right uh, the pacemaker it tells you what are all the, the capabilities that are this is like a defibrillator which has the battery, the capacitor, the low and high rate set, voltage set and it also detects asystole, it also detects heart failure for that matter. Then it can detect slow heart rate, fast heart rates, VTAC, VFib and in addition it can shock if it is necessary if the patient is having a ventricular tachycardia or fibrillation. In a practice after we have put in a pacemaker, when they come back to the office or to the clinic, we check their pacemakers every six months. And as the battery life goes down, we may check them every three months. The more recent pacemakers have remote transmissions, so the patients don't really need to come to the clinic, especially they live an hour, two hours from the clinic, and they can transmit that through the Wi-Fi and that information can be downloaded on a computer in the clinic or in a doctor's office and analyzed. The first thing that we analyze is the battery life. How much voltage is there, how much voltage it started with, and how many years of life left. The more the pacemaker fires, the more battery energy is used. The more the pacemaker sits quiet, and doesn't fire, the battery life is prolonged. And if you look at here, this battery has a 3.01 voltage volts, and it has a lifespan of 5.3 to 8.7 based on how much energy is used to activate the heart. So based upon the amount of energy needed to keep the heart going, the battery life can vary quite significantly. But when you come towards the end of the battery life, when the voltage is dropping precipitously and it goes down very fast, that's when we need to have these patients ready for battery replacement or gen change, as they call it, or the generator change. They, are, they are use different terminologies, pacemaker battery, pacemaker case, pacemaker generator, they all mean the same thing. It's that little box that's in the shoulder here. We have very sophisticated machines in the clinics and in the hospital clinics where we can do a thorough analysis of these pacemakers. In addition to that, we can reprogram the pacemakers various parameters to get optimal cardiac performance, to minimize patient symptoms and perhaps increase the longevity of the pacemaker battery. And here, as we can see, this is an actual case where we see the battery voltage is 
and it has a life expectancy of uh, 7 to 10.5 years. So we know this battery is not going to give up in the next year or two. These lithium batteries are extremely reliable compared to your uh, camera flash batteries or something like that that can last only one day. I mean, that's not going to work here. Here is another one which is showing the voltage is 2.77 volts and the battery life uh, ranging in this uh, 7 to 10.5 years. When we monitor these pacemakers using these programmers, we can actually use these as electrodes to monitor the activity within each chamber. If we monitor the atrial activity, we can see this is the atrial activity. When the atria are activated, this is the signal we get. This is called the intramyocardial electrogram. It's called the EMG. If we monitor the, the ventricular electrode, we can get the right ventricular activity. Then we have the left ventricle, that is the coronary sinus. And this is the one. And here is the surface e electrocardiogram. The beauty of this is if somebody is having a arrhythmia coming from the upper chambers like atrial flutter or fibrillation, then there will be a lot more atrial beats compared to the ventricular beats. On the other hand, if someone is having a ventricular tachycardia, then we're going to see a very fast ventricular rate where the atrial rate may be normal. That, like the one we see in patients with sinus rhythm. So in this way, it helps us to identify an arrhythmia much more accurately than a surface electrocardiogram or even today monitor. Again, it's talking about existing rhythm, lead functionality in terms of recognizing the signals, in terms of delivering the electrical signals. Then the battery status, we already covered the battery status. So this is the EMG, that is a intramyocardial electrocardiogram. And we talked about this atrial activity, ventricular activity, and this is the surface ECG. Defibrillators, which are built into these pacemakers, are designed to deliver an electric shock. But there are times when the pacemaker may think this patient is having a serious arrhythmia and it wants to deliver a shock. And it is not uncommon that sometimes the arrhythmia which the pacemaker thought was serious may not turn out to be serious. As a result, it may deliver an inappropriate shock. And as you can see, the pacemaker defibrillators have been around since uh, 1997. That's more than like 23 years. And we still have a significant number of uh, shocks that are delivered by these defibrillators based on various studies showing that uh, it is impossible to eliminate this, the so-called unnecessary shocks. See, when I started off, I said the pacemakers, one of the main functions is to identify if there's an electrical impulse coming from the heart, say, for example, the atrium. If the atria are beating, then the pacemaker doesn't need to do any work. It just needs to listen. Listen to the electrical signal and sit quiet. We have to program this one so that it knows the electrical impulse is coming from the atria. Since the voltage varies from the atrial activity to the ventricular activity, they, we have to set the sensitivity of a lead to just detect the atrial activity. And that's where the sensitivity comes into play. The sensitivity in the atria are much lower compared to the sensitivity that is set for the ventricular activity. For example, in the atria, we may say, if you see any signal that is 1.25 or greater, think that as the atrial activity. That means the atria are working, so you don't need to go and fire another beat on top of that. Whereas in the ventricle, it may be much higher, like 5 to 10. And in the ventricular electrode, if you set it to like 7.5, it looks for any electrical activity 7.5. And if it sees that electrical activity, then the pacemaker doesn't do any extra work. It lets the human heart continue with the rhythm.
So that's the sensitivity part of the pacemaker for atria and the ventricle. They are separate. That's what we need to keep in mind. And here is like for the ventricular activity, you, you want to make sure the signal is closer to 5, not 0.1, not 1.25. If you set it too low, then it may pick up some muscle signals, muscle tremors, something like that, and it may get confused and start pacing at a very rapid rate, which you don't want. The usual P wave sensitivity is set to 1.5 in the first three months, and as the electrode gets more established, the sensitivity drops to 1.0 millivolts. That means it can recognize P waves with an amplitude of uh, 1 millivolts and when it sees it suppresses the atrial lead from creating a beat. Same thing with the R waves, it is 6 millivolts here and by after 3 months when in a chronic state it can recognize an R wave 5 millimeters or greater and then suppress the ventricular activity. If it doesn't see an R wave equal to 5 millimeters it will fire. It also knows when to look for the R wave so many milliseconds after the P wave because remember we also have T waves which are sometimes greater than 5 millivolts so we don't want the pacemaker to recognize the T wave as an R wave the morphology and all these things uh, go into the equation and this is just showing that if our atrial activity is at this level we want to set the pacemaker detection at this level so that it detects only the activity of the atria but if the wire is in the ventricle and if the ventricular activity is of this range then we want to set the sensitivity to an appropriate level to just recognize the ventricular activity the normal beats and sometimes when you get an extra beat it may throw the system off and it, it may give a wrong signal and that's why sometimes we see the pacemakers don't recognize the premature ventricular complexes because of a significant change in the voltage uh, so the pacemaker may fire near the vent ventricular ectop ectopic beat because it's, it's just not able to precisely recognize those beats let's do some examples here now we have a pacemaker spike and the ventricle is activated. Here we have a pacemaker spike and the ventricle is activated. Now a normal impulse comes in and the pacemaker knows, okay, I don't need to fire the atrium. Then it sees a QRS complex. It says, okay, I don't need to fire the ventricles like it did here. But now the pacemaker spike is coming here. So this is improper sensing. It sensed, initially it sensed uh, the normal beat, but somehow later on it just came and delivered an electrical impulse, which is not appropriate because it is not sensing this PQRS complex in an appropriate manner as it is set to recognize. Similarly, we have a pace beat, pace beat and we have the same issue here. So this is uh, improper sensing. Okay, and let's see what we have. We have a pace beat, we have a normal beat, and we have a long pause here. If the pacemaker cycle is this much, then you expect the next beat to come somewhere here, but we are not uh, seeing the pacemaker spike. That means it is not able to recognize the pause and it is not even delivering the electrical impulse. So that's how we look for any abnormalities in the pacemaker function by looking at it is supposed to do and it doesn't do. The next thing is when the pacemaker battery is sending electrical energy through the wire, of course it's going through a metal wire and this transmission of electrical energy is based on the voltage I equals current R equals resistance. So by knowing two of these parameters, we can calculate the third one. So we, we know the electrical voltage, we, we know the current, 
and we can always find out the resistance. The resistance is something that is uh, created by the pacemaker wire. If it's uh, not in good contact, so the resistance goes up. If there are leaks in the pacemaker leads uh, due to breakage, then the resistance goes down. And that determines how much of current is used by that pacemaker to activate the atria or the ventricle. So this formula, which is current in amperes, is equal to voltage, that is the amount of voltage delivered divided by the resistance. So we, are in, we already talked about how much voltage is going to be used for pacemaker, used by the pacemaker. That's for the total pacemaker duration, but we're going to come back and talk about how much voltage is used for each heartbeat. Then we talk about resistance. Now, talking about resistance, if a water pipe has no block obstruction, the water flow is normal. Whatever the water is coming in goes through the pipe. Same thing, if there is no, if the contact with the heart muscle is good, and if there are no breaks or kinks, then the electrical current has very low resistance to activate the atria or the ventricle. On the other hand, if the leads are broken, then the electrical current may be leaking through those. The resistance is low, but it's not pacing the heart. So we need to identify these abnormalities because some of these may mean replacing the electrode. On the other hand, if, if we have knots or something like that, that can increase the resistance and also lead to non-capture of the atria or the ventricles. It is shown in a slightly different manner and this is the normal one. Here we have insulation breakdown that leads to current drainage and here the resistance is high, low current drainage here, but you still don't have the function. Let's talk about the voltage. Remember I talked about the voltage is the amount of energy that is delivered to activate the atria or the ventricles. So the voltage is based upon the pulse width, the total energy used to activate a single heartbeat is based upon the pulse width which is generally 40 milliseconds and the voltage, the voltage is going to be expressed as millivolts. We'll look at that in a minute. And here we can see the, the amplitude of that old, this, this is the amplitude and this is the pulse width and this is the pulse width. And if you look at here for the atria and for the ventricle, it actually measures the amplitude 1.64 volts. And the pulse width is 40 milliseconds, which is the same thing. And here the amplitude is 2.21. So there's more energy needed to activate the ventricle than what is needed to activate the atrial muscle. So these are all the important informations we can get in addition to the battery life and a whole host of other things as we will find out as, as we proceed. This is how the pulse amplitude and width looks. Here we have the pulse amplitude, then it has a leading edge and a trailing edge. This is the total amount of energy that is delivered to the muscle to activate the atria or the ventricle. When we are testing the pacemaker for the first time after placing a new lead, we try to pace the ventricles at like 1.5 volts. Okay, it's pacing 100%, dun, 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 dun. You go to 1.0. Said maybe we don't need 1.5, let's go to 1.0. Tuck, 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 it's pacing. He said, well, one is doing pretty good, so let's try 0.5 volts. That means the lesser the voltage, the lesser energy needed to keep the heart beating. Basically, we want to keep the heart beating. We don't want to use the, all the energy in the battery to activate the ventricles. So here at 0.5, it drops off. That means, uh-uh, if you leave the patient on 0.5, then it is not going to be able to capture the ventricle. So we need to set the voltage at 1.0 to be safe so that we have 100% ventricular capture or activation.
and as you can see here's one volt which was pacing good 0.5 volt it was doing good when you go to 0.25 it drops so the capture is lost that means the energy is too weak it cannot activate the ventricle to kick the ventricles you need certain energy and that's 0.5 is the reasonable energy and you're not using too much energy because if you use one instead of 0.5 you're draining the battery twice as fast Another function of the pacemaker is electrical shocking or intracardiac defibrillation. And here's an example. This patient is having a very rapid rate, uh, almost like 300 beats per minute. And uh, the pacemaker detects, oh, we got a very rapid heart rate. It is dangerous. So it's time to shock. So it delivers a shock. Then the rhythm converts to a sort of a slower rate for this one. And here, so this is called the atrial pacing and ventricular pacing. It's pacing the atria, it's pacing the ventricles. Marching right along. And here we have atrial sensing because it's a normal a P wave. Then we have a paced ventricular bit. Atrial sensing, ventricular pacing. Same thing here. Now if you look at here, we have a atrial pacing and ventricular sensing. That means it paced the atria and the impulse went through the normal AV conduction system and we have a supraventricular QRS complex. So there was no need for the pacemaker to pace the ventricle. So this is atrial pacing, ventricular sensing. Finally, we have it is atrial sensing and ventricular sensing. Pacemaker is just listening. Atria, ting, good. Ventricles, good. Atria, good. Ventricles, good. So I'm, I'm not going to fire anything. So that's the situation here. Yeah. So that's how you identify different types of stuff. Here's another tachyarrhythmia, which was uh, spontaneously, which, which, which was terminated by giving what is called known as the rapid pacing. You look at the tachycardia rate, then you pace it at a rate slightly faster than the tachycardia, then we should be able to terminate the arrhythmia in most cases and now it's pacing 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 what happened here what's the problem do we have a sensing problem do we have a pacing problem do we have a capture problem okay the beat came here the beat came here and it sensed it said okay there's no beat here i need to send i need to create a beat so it sends the electrical impulse so it's sensed properly, it paced properly, but we don't see the ventricular activity. So it's a failure to capture. So the ventricle, even though the pacemaker beat came, electrical impulse came on time, the ventricle is sleeping, it's kaput. It didn't capture. There are any number of reasons why a ventricle doesn't act, but uh, it is not capturing. So that's how we determine the function. That helps us to see maybe we need to increase the voltage or something to make sure that the ventricles are capturing 100% of the time. What do we got here? We got a atrial sensing, ventricular pacing, atrial sensing, pacing, and uh, we have entry. But now, I'm sorry, here we have atrial sensing and no, narrow QRS complex, but we have, so this is atrial pacing and ventricular sensing but look at here this is coming after the p wave that means it is not sensing properly the p waves this should not have come here because we already have the atrial activity we, we have a normal beat then we have a pacemaker beat the pacemaker is supposed to be just listening if there's a normal beat but it's interfering with the rhythm so this is inappropriate we talked about these various terminologies for the pacemakers. Now here is an actual report from a pacemaker study on a patient who had a generator replaced the previous day. And we're going to look at all the parameters which we talked about and see what we can come up with and see if this pacemaker defibrillator is working appropriately. This was the ICD generator replacement. The ICD manufacturer was Boston Scientific and here's the, the name for this battery. Is the diagnosis for ventricular tachycardia, cardiomyopathy, data of implantation was uh, this one, and elective replacement, the battery life was greater than seven years, this is a brand new battery that was put in just a few days ago.
and here we look at the resistance the ohms the most important thing that we me measure is the atrial resistance this must be less than a thousand so this is 576 this is 402 which is within reasonable limit and i talked about the r wave amplitude that's the energy electrical energy that is delivered to the ventricles and to the atria so the atrial r wave amplitude you know this is the ability of the heart to recognize the electrical impulse that means the electrode is seeing can see an impulse 7.6 volt uh, impulse so that's pretty good you know we want it to be make sure that it is greater than 5 it can also detect a p wave amplitude of 1.5 we got pacing threshold remember i showed you those pacing thresholds if it, if it's 1.5 it was pacing 100% 1.0 100% 0.5 volts uh, miss the beats and this is what it's saying at 0.7 volts at 40 milliseconds it can pace the atria 100% and same thing with the ventricles it's, it's double the energy and 60 milliseconds so that's tells and this d d d r that's the functionality of the pacemaker dual chamber sensing pacing inhibitor or triggered and rate responsive this is a lower limit of the rate upper limit of the rate and then we have this uh, energy that is used the atrial amplitude is uh, 2 volts for 40 milliseconds, 3 volts for 60 milliseconds. So the sensitivity of atria is 0.25, ventricle is 0.6. That means it can pace its ventricles and atria without much effort. After that, it tells how many shocks were delivered, how many shocks were aborted. Then we look for any arrhythmias like tachyarrhythmias atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, ventricular tachycardia, anything like that, then we come up with a final report. Okay, this is a normal ICD function. Atrial pacing was less than 1% of the time. Ventricular pacing was 84% of the time. So the ventricles are seriously dependent on this pacemaker for their function and the rate, how it was set, and the medication the patient is getting. So ladies and gentlemen, in a nutshell, this is a very quick and brief overview of pacemakers, pacemaker evaluation and management in the clinics, at bedside, in the intensive care unit. This is good for cardiology fellows, for general cardiologists, so that you can keep track of your patients with pacemakers and have a basic knowledge of how to analyze a pacemaker report. Thank you so much for watching this presentation. Please, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and we will see you next time. I am Dr. Nick Nickham for Cardiology Lectures. See you next time. Thank <laughs> you.